Okay, so I just want to spend a little bit of time at the end here, and then we'll take questions on multiple sclerosis, which is um, a little bit of a different animal, but we have a little bit more research on the diet angle here. Uh, multiple sclerosis, about 400,000 people in the United States have it. It's usually diagnosed between the ages of 20 and 40. Women are three times more likely to develop it than men. Again, we, every autoimmune disease we see, base, almost every autoimmune disease, we see basically the same thing. There are two types, relapsing, remitting, and primary progressive. Um, relapsing, remitting means that you have an episode followed by a period of remission. And one of the things about this is that I think drugs get credit for a lot of what would have been spontaneous remissions for a period of time before the disease starts to progress again. So I think that makes the medical literature kind of confusing on the efficacy of drugs, although I'll show you uh, some pretty good data on the efficacy of drugs. So it doesn't really matter how it starts. In other words, if it starts relapsing, remitting, it doesn't mean that you're not going to be miserable at some point in time. At some point in time, almost every autoimmune disease, including MS, starts to progress. So what are the causes? Well, you know, again, we have people who say we don't know. We have people that say it's genetics. Uh, studies show that in areas of the world in which saturated fat consumption is higher, the incidence of MS is higher too, like the United States, Canada, and Europe. This relationship is even true within countries. Like in Norway, um, the diet is much lower fat at the coastal areas than it is internally, and you see a difference in the um, incidence of multiple sclerosis there. Cow's milk was found to be as predictive for cow's milk consumption for the development of MS as living in a northern altitude. And there is some element of molecular mimicry, which I talked to you about earlier. So Dr. Roy Swank was the grandfather of research on, on uh, multiple sclerosis. Um, he, this is his theory, and he proved it with a great deal of research, that sometimes MS begins in infancy. Formula-fed babies lie down, lay down a very poor foundation in the myelin that becomes more susceptible to injury. Later, a virus or a bad diet, lots of different things can happen that injure the nervous system. And these injuries are almost always near blood vessels, which cause Swank to believe that a diet that caused injury to the blood vessels might be a contributing factor to a neurological disease. Um, according to several papers that Swank authored, um, and he, he authored quite a few, when people eat a diet high in saturated fat, the blood cells are coated and stick together. But then clumps form in every capillary. Oxygen tension in the blood vessels drops. This disturbs the blood-brain barrier, allowing substances access to the nervous system that would not normally cross the barrier. Antibodies to food proteins resulting from leaky gut attack the myelin. Swank concluded that MS was the result of the weakening of both the blood-brain barrier and the intestinal mucosa. In other words, he was talking about leaky gut a few decades before everybody else started talking about it. So here's one of his initial group of people. He took 144 patients from the Montreal Neurological Institute. He followed them for 34 years. He was sort of the Dr. Esselstyn of multiple sclerosis. The patients were placed on a low saturated fat diet, 1 to 15 grams a day. The progression of MS was stopped or reduced, or, or stopped, reduced or stopped by the low saturated fat diet. The reduction in fat was effective even for those with advanced MS at the start of the study. The first year, there was a 70% reduction in what's called exacerbations, flares of the nervous system disorder. 5% per year after that, 95% total reduction it remained constant for 16 years. And he reported that only one in 500 patients did not respond to dietary intervention. So we can say to a multiple sclerosis patient with a great deal of certainty that you are likely to benefit from changing your diet, highly likely to benefit from changing your diet. So here was a summary of what he found. 95% of patients consuming a low saturated fat diet remained normal or only mildly disabled at the end of 30 years and only 5% died. 80% of the patients who continued to consume the high fat diet died. 80% versus 5%, that's a huge difference. He published a lot of additional study, studies documenting his success with over 5,000 patients and other researchers have confirmed his work. Now, I mentioned this before, the drugs are incredibly ineffective for MS, and I think they get credit for the relapsing, remitting pattern in the beginning. Um, for example, interferon, interferon beta, which is a common 
uh, drug. And by the way, why do I show you this? Because this is part of informed medical decision making. If you're having trouble getting patients to change their diet to a plant-based diet, show them what happens if they just take drugs. So among patients with relapsing remitting MS, administration of interferon beta was not associated with a reduction in progression of disability. The ultimate goal of treatment for MS is to prevent or delay long-term disability. Our findings bring into question the routine use of interferon beta drugs to achieve this goal in MS. So I'm going to show you something that it, it would be funny if it weren't so serious, all right? So um, the multiple sclerosis risk sharing scheme was developed by the National Health Service in the UK in 2002. And um, what happened was that there was an interesting observation made, which was that patients who had no treatment, who had multiple sclerosis, were doing better than the patients with treatment. So the NHS managed to extract a promise from the drug companies that what they would do from now on is they would pay the drug companies based on how effective the drugs were. Does that sound fair? I think that's fair. All right. So that's what, what, the, what the plan was. So this went on for a little while, um, and patients basically taking the drugs were worse off than the patients who didn't take the drugs. And so um, the NHS said to the drug companies, well, you owe us money because now we have all these people that have been harmed by your drugs and it would have been better if we did nothing, so you're going to have to pay. Well, the drug companies refused to do it. And um, you could follow the story in the British Medical Journal for a good long time while they fought over what to do. And it never really did get resolved, but this was the conclusion, and I think this is important to read. Outcome-based schemes should probably be avoided if all possible, if at all possible. In other words, if you're going to come up with this pesky evidence stuff that shows that what we're doing is a bad idea, maybe we just shouldn't look. Are you kidding me? Okay, but this is what happens when you start looking at the evidence. In fact, the Cochrane Collaboration, which is the most, one of the most independent medical research organizations on the planet, said that the use of the best drugs that we have available, which cost about $56,000 a year for the average MS patient, have absolutely no effect. And the same number of people will be disabled, uh, wheelchair bound, bed bound, or dead at the, at the end of any period of time you want to measure, whether they take drugs or take no drugs. Same thing. All right, so that makes a pretty compelling case for diet, don't you think? And it's surprising when you show this information to people how many MS patients say, give me the plants, okay? I totally understand what you're talking about. This is a path to nowhere. Eating the plants is the path I want to take. So the bottom line is that autoimmune diseases are usually a result of poor diet um, and lifestyle habits, which lead to things like high estrogen levels, leaky gut, molecular mimicry, chronic infections, chronic inflammation, allergies, asthma. Um, and if you change those things, you can change the outcome. And most importantly, you can keep more autoimmune diseases from developing. I had somebody in my office a couple weeks ago, three weeks ago, who had seven autoimmune diseases, seven of them. The original one she had went back to when she was in grade school. Small patches of psoriasis, which people thought, no big deal. Well, small patches of psoriasis turned into more psoriasis, which turned into rheumatoid arthritis, which turned into Hashimoto's um, thyroiditis, which turned into lupus, which, and it went on and on. All right, so we're in the process now of trying to fix that. I wish I'd had her a long time ago.